Welcome to the <clears throat> Future of Work podcast. Our guest today is Peter Misovich, uh, Managing Director for Strategy and Innovation at JLL. With over 25 years, Peter's management consulting expertise includes enterprise workplace strategies, operational performance improvement, real estate portfolio solutions, combined with expertise in workplace transformation. He has helped transform over one and a half billion rentable square feet of corporate real estate, including the development of 50 Fortune 100 corporate headquarters projects. In addition, Peter is the co-author of the book, The Workplace You Need Now, Shaping Spaces for the Future of Work. Welcome, Peter. I'm really glad to have you today. It's a pleasure to be with you, Frank. Great to be here today. You know, I'd, I'd really like to jump into it real quick. We've got a lot to cover. You and I have already talked about a few things and and uh, kind of matched up uh, our backgrounds and, and some common people that we know and projects we're familiar with. So I'd like to just jump right into it and, and, and ask you, how do you think organizations should be redesigning their workspaces to, um, to ensure that employees remain engaged uh, now that we're in the hybrid working environment? And specifically, what steps do you think are effective in designing workspace that, divide, that, that, that drives innovation? Great, Frank. And long, glad long to... question, I know, long question. <laughs> no, it's a great question. I'd like to provide a little bit of historical context. We began our career 25 years ago in global workplace transformation with Anderson Consulting at the time. And we orchestrated hybrid workplace pilots with Anderson Consulting, Accenture, Citibank, AT&T, IBM, actually some early work with McKinsey and uh, Bain Consulting as well. And what's fascinating, Pri PricewaterhouseCoopers, I should name as a former PwC partner. And what's fascinating is that 25 years ago, we were asking the same question. How do we enable hybrid work? How do we enable new ways of working, engage talent, and create um, not only talent attraction and retention, but greater innovation. And so if we fast forward 25 years, and then we look at the pandemic over the last two and a half years as an accelerant, we're really in this new era of hybrid workplace transformation. And from our work with IDC, for example, we know that 70% of all firms will be hybrid by 2025. We know from IDC that there will be a 90% uh, talent shortage of digital talent required. We know from IDC that 90% um, of all companies will invest heavily into smart workplace technology investments. And we know from IDC by 2025, eight out of 10 meetings will occur in augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, metaverse enabled environments. Well, you so know, this, people, I, I'm, I'm going to throw one. You're great at this IDC. I'm going to throw one more IDC number in at you. Okay. Um, in 2019, just before the pandemic, IDC indicated that there were 1.8 billion remote workers worldwide. And they defined that as an, any individual that worked two days or more per week away from their primary workspace. So when you're using these percentages and you apply that against 1.8 billion people, at least, yeah, th th this is tectonic what you're talking about. It truly is, Frank. And, and you know, so that was 2019 and, and the, the IDC data that I'm sharing is uh, 2022 January. What's fascinating that in March of 2020, 3 billion people went hybrid remote in a matter of three to four weeks. And yes. I, I've been hybrid remote for 20 years. At Once upon a time, Frank, I had three offices in New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles, and two secretaries. And yes. I went to the office every day, sometimes six days a week, because that's where my computers were, that's where my files were, that's where my, at the time, EA secretaries supported me. And, you know, we were tethered once upon a time to the office 25 years ago. And so as we look at the migration and the progression from you know 1995 to 2005 to 2015 
to 2025, the progression of digital enabled hybrid work has been an ongoing evolution my entire career. And I've built my career and my focus and my Fortune 100 client relationships based upon new ways of working and hybrid workplace enablement. And so from my perspective, this is the only way to work. And it <laughs> took, I hate to say it, 25 years in a global horrific pandemic. We shouldn't underestimate you know, the, the, the horrific consequences of the pandemic, but it served as an accelerant to validate the value proposal of hybrid work and these new ways of working. And so from innovation perspective, we believe that actually innovation will be enhanced as a result of hybrid work practices. Collaboration will be enhanced, culture will be enhanced. And those organizations that engage in hybrid work with the two pillars of trust and transparency will actually have exceptional performance and have exceptional talent attraction and exceptional innovation. So it's not a um, smooth ride in every case. And I will share with you the piloting from 25 years ago was by no means you know, smooth or easy, but I think this is the evolution of workplace behavior that began you know, 25 years ago and will continue through 2025 and beyond. And I think it's really almost challenging to forecast by 2030, you know, what will digital hybrid work, virtual work, um, enablement really look like? And, and I think it's a fascinating question that, you know, we're very much focused upon with our 75 client uh, engagements that I'm orchestrating and we're orchestrating as JLL Consulting and really rethinking the whole workplace value proposal. So well, it's, it's a fascinating time. You, you know, it, it is. And it, it's funny when, when you look forward and you say, we don't even know what to, to call 2030 in, in, in that period, I'm just going to call it work. I'm not going to call it hybrid or this or that. I'm just going to call it work. Right. Um, when, when you look at, I'm going to make a silly analogy. When you look at boysenberry jelly or jam today, you don't say, oh, it's a hybrid. That's just boysenberry jelly. And, right. and I, I think we're going to look at all the things that we do as just normal. And it's not new normal because if it's new, then it's not normal by definition. Overall, and today you and I are on a video. You're in New York, and I'm out in Texas. And and um, I'm, my first video system I put in was in 1982. <laughs> Very good for you. Okay. Uh, 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 so uh, the, the, we have all been evolving. And I think the most important word that you've said several times is evolution. That this is not something we have little periods of shock. Uh, mm -hmm. such as a pandemic, but it is a continuous evolution. And one thing that we've seen in all business evolution, at least, is it accelerates. Right. And that's when we look, say 2030, we can't even imagine. Well, we can't because the acceleration rate is what we don't, we, we, we can't calculate in. We can say what we see today and what its uh, absorption or adaption might be we think it might be and, and, and such, but we don't know how fast and when that happens, what else it will spawn. Uh, and and I, I know kind of kind of exemplifying that, you, m moving on to, to next uh, 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 kind of question is how technology is changing the way that we collaborate and how there's a lot of talk about metaverse, both good and bad, but um, uh, when it comes to the future of work, the, the most important thing is recruiting new talent, bringing new talent in, collaboration. How are things like Google Starline going to work? Um, if, if you're, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Yes. Um, uh, holographic meetings. My first holographic receptionist, by the way, was in a box. It looked like a little Disney thing. 1984, again. I had a holographic mm -hmm. receptionist at the front desk of an office building. Uh, overall, and it was gimmicky, very gimmickly. Right. But today, it's 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 reality. Uh, you and I should be three dimensional in the same room holographically right now. We could be, and we will be. 
and I think Frank, that's a great, um, I think, introduction to this not only concept of evolution, but progressive, accelerated, combinatorial convergence. And I'll give example again, I think historically, which is helpful, and then certainly will address your great question. I remember getting my first iPhone in 2007, and it wasn't allowed in the enterprise, and I had to have a workaround with the iPhone. And then 4G you know, networks were coming into the workplace. And then the iPhone was accepted, and then the cloud was sort of being you know, scaled, born, launched in that same time frame, and the iPad occurred in 2010. And so then in 2010 to 15, you had this evolution of co-working and co-working environments and experiential workplace. And so for the last 15 years, there's been this journey on mobile work, cloud-based work, uh, activated um, technologies that really enable us to work anywhere. And that's been probably a 10 to 15 year progression. Mm -hmm. And so now in 2022, as we go to 25, 27, the metaverse and the three-dimensional inter internet, if you will, web 3.0, gamification of work, um, synthetic humans, which we're, we're seeing in some of our work with Accenture, um, we're going to have another accelerated um, evolutionary period between now and 25, 2025, 2027, that will most likely scale augmented reality, um, mixed reality, virtual reality, and the metaverse. And I'll share pu well publicly our work with Accenture where over 100,000 folks at Accenture have been recruited via the metaverse. And we're currently educating um, a number of our clients. I have a good colleague that we're working very closely with, educating our clients on the future of the metaverse. What are the use cases? And a couple of factoids from the metaverse, for example, that metaverse training, immersive training, is 150% to even 200% more effective than classroom training, as one example. Another example, recruitment, the ability to engage folks in immersive interview environments where they really get to um, perhaps perceive and experience both the interviewer with the interviewee in a whole different context and potentially to experience the organization in a much more immersive context than just sitting in um, you know, an interview room, in an office, in a physical location. And so this immersive three-dimensional internet experience that's now just launching and scaling, we believe from an enterprise perspective, as we see Apple Reality, Apple Reality Pro will get launched next year. Google Starline virtual mirroring, which is, you know, you would be against a mirror, I would be against a mirror, and I've experienced this technology with Google, and you feel almost that I could reach out and, and we could touch fingertips, and there's a haptic sensory experience yeah. from from yeah. google starline um apple apple reality i think apple's augmented reality capabilities what microsoft is doing with hol holography and three-dimensional immersive technologies which i experienced recently in redmond with microsoft are really powerful um, accenture has 600 patents right now focused on metaverse enterprise applications meta itself of course has invested heavily amazon is investing so I think the convergence of all of this investment and innovation, and I'll go back to 27, 27, 2010, 2012, that period of tremendous combinatorial convergence, we're having another accelerated period of convergence of technology evolution right now that will certainly continue and, and may continue through this entire decade, but definitely through 2025. And those organizations that are willing to at least test and experience experiment and pilot, and I'll quote Satya Nadella, I just love Satya as CEO of Microsoft, to take a learning mindset approach to workplace transformation and workplace evolution. Those organizations and leaders who take that approach will have, I think, tremendous successful outcomes if they're willing to have the courage to take you know, that experimentation on at the enterprise level. So well, glad yeah. to share more. On that topic you, you know you every company that you just referenced there while they're all global companies they're all u.s based yes every single one of them um but everything you're talking about is global 
in its action. There are comparable companies in, uh, in fact, one of the companies Accenture is using uh, uh, for uh, yeah. uh, its, its um, <clears throat> immersive work is, is based in, in, in Europe. Um, uh, we've, we've worked with them as well. And in fact, I was wearing my little headset for a few days and I actually knocked the coffee off my desk. It was embarrassing. Um, uh, but uh, so we, we see these all over. And I think one of the questions when we talk about the future of work, um, we have to talk about being competitive, um, each of us from our own perspective. And if we don't have this learning mindset, someone else will. And so this is not a race against one another. It's really a race together uh, on a global basis, because this is one of the ways through communications, through interactions that not only business will grow, but peoples and governments and all of our cultures will grow as well. Uh, and hopefully, and I'm not a great forecaster of world peace, but hopefully the way these technologies evolve will bring us much closer together, just as, as you and I are comfortable using this technology today. We've both been using it forever, it seems like. Um, um, the new technologies of the future, which are that, bring us that much closer to reality, um, will, will not just solve business problems, but will solve a variety of problems potentially. And how, how do you see that? Uh, it, and, and relating to the future of work, but just to the future in general. So, so two thoughts there, and we, you know, we have a relationship with Stanford's Human Center Artificial Intelligence Research Group, and also with MIT. And what's and there's a new trend that's been emerging. I don't know if you've heard this trend called friend shoring, where countries yeah. that are friendly with one another will probably be trading partners in the future, and then the you know, the AI winter, I think we've seen dissipate. We've, you know, we're in an AI spring. We might be going into a metaverse winter. We'll see. But I think from a from a global perspective, the collaborative ecosystems of organizations, and I'll use our relationship with both Accenture and Microsoft right now, uh, and with Google and with Amazon, we are partnering with those technology firms, with clients to solve complex workplace and real, real estate and workforce you know, challenges and issues. And so I think there's a societal uplift and an enterprise uplift from a collaboration perspective, but there are constraints now globally with some of the geopolitical risk that we're seeing occur, you know, across the world. I mean, Russia and Ukraine comes to mind, uh, China and Taiwan comes to mind. Um, I'm really interested in how India continues to evolve as a global superpower, both in terms of technology and innovation. So, and, and I'm doing quite a bit of work right now in Latin America and also certain parts of Asia. And so there is this globalization trend that is continuing, but in a different context. So my clients right now, for instance, in Latin America or India or Asia are looking for localized hybrid workplace integration pilots and programs that are highly local, but they'd like delivery from global firms such as JLL, Microsoft, and Google. And sort of, you know, I, call, I used to be a globalist. I'm now a globalist. I, I am global in mindset, but local in orientation, if you will, and execution. Because what's right for, for Frank in Texas may be different for Peter in New York, which will be different for, you know, someone in Latin America or in Eastern Europe or in India. And so we're seeing this customization approach, especially as it relates to hybrid work, which is fascinating by region. And even within cities, Frank, I have six projects right now in India. And with each, and in each of those cities within India, the hybrid workplace strategies are unique and different. Different, yes. And, and, and the dialects I mean, can be different too. Well, and preferences, work preferences, commuting preferences, workforce preferences, business model, differences. So it's there's a fascinating divergence between, I'll, I won't name the client, but I once orchestrated 200 offices globally for a client where every office was the same globally, the same computer equipment, the same paint colors, the same signage, the same <laughs> desk chairs. 
Everything yeah. was the same because that client wanted a 200 office global branding yep. or branded footprint. And I look back on that and I would never ever recommend or that strategy would just not be in the realm of possibilities today in 2022 because of all the diversity and enculturation and DEI and sustainability and truly country culture uh, importance in terms of honoring communities and honoring culture at that localized level. So, so I think the, the age of old globalization is over. And if we think about friend shoring, if we think about the future, if we think about regional and cultural and country um, differences, I think those will be celebrated and they will become increasingly more important as, as part of the path forward, if, if that makes sense. Well, it, it, it does in some respects, but it, it also brings some, some challenges forth. Um, how do you remain local and act global? How do you act, think globally and act locally? All of that comes back and forth. There's a whole bunch of cliches around that, that whole issue. Um, but, but the reality is that um, remote work of all formats um, allows us to explore these, this issue. And we do have to find a solution to it. Uh, and the solution is not as simple as someone in Sao Paulo and Brazil using Google to do remote work, uh, help them set up remote work in Sao Paulo, because every company today is international. We all have an international supplier and we all have an international client. And unless we can act locally wherever you are um, uh, and be local in our understandings wherever you are, then the technology will just be, it won't have, a, have, have really helped us. Well, we're seeing, for instance, even in certain cities in Latin America or in Asia Pacific, remote work is being embraced, but it's being embraced to varying degrees. So for instance, if I value going into the office five days a week to socialize and engage with my colleagues in a particular city in India or Latin America or Asia Pacific, then that is what I call part of the, the evolution of work, the future of work, and actually it's part of hybrid. If I have one client, for example, we have 20,000 customer service agents that were all in the office five days a week, they're all going fully remote, remote Frank. And those customer service agents will not go to an office at all except for once a quarter for two days of cultural engagement and training. And so both, if you will, extremes of that continuum can exist within the same company, within the same country, within the same city, and within the same campus, within the same city. And so this is the new diversified exper experiential um, you know, workplace program evolution and we as jll you know sponsor and support clients in that navigation of the future of work to allow for diversity of hybrid work and hybrid workplace outcomes and behaviors and all of it being enabled you know by technology and even if you're in the office five days a week you may have colleagues and say like i'm in the office five days a week in new york i may have colleagues in sao paulo or in Romania, or in you know Kuala Lumpur, so that hybrid conferencing, collaborative capability and collaboration collaboration capability is actually more important today. Whether you're in the office, whether you're in a home office, whether you're in a co-working site, or if you're in the metaverse for Accenture, for example, you're able to be in an Accenture conference room. You can be in a Teams meeting and be in the metaverse simultaneously and have the same meeting experience or a unified meeting experience within Accenture right now. And other, other organizations, Microsoft is following, um, following that same, same pattern. So it's a fascinating diversification of workplace enablement, workplace experiential choice, and a high degree of choice and customization. And all of it can be managed perhaps through a new cost uh, management envelope based upon you know real-time utilization 
um, technology enabled, you know, dynamic occupancy management. I mean, if you think about airlines and the hotels, I mean, those of us remember airlines, I, you know, before 9-11, I used to get on a plane 10 minutes before the doors closed. There wasn't security, seats would be empty. You could get on a plane. I mean, good luck today, you know, changing a flight and trying to get a seat on another flight. So dynamic, you know, flight seat management came to the airline industry as did dynamic hotel, you know, space management come to the room management, come to the hotel industry. And we're going to see dynamic occupancy management across the trillions of square feet that exist tomorrow, perhaps not yet today. No, I, 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 I agree with you completely. That's a perfect segue because what we've been talking about are people, borders, uh, cultures, technologies, and all of our reactions to these things. But what we haven't really hit is where you and I share decades and decades of background about commercial real estate. What's the impact of all of this on commercial real estate? Are we going to Gosh, if, if you're working uh, one day out of the office per week, that's a 20% vacancy factor in your seat. Two, 40, three, 60. And we're forecasting here two to three on average. So right. let's say I have a 50% vacancy factor in every commercial office, which means when leases come up, there's going to be a reassessment of need and it's probably going to say, I don't need as much anymore. That's what we're hearing. I'm sure you're hearing and seeing the same thing. We already have a fabulously built infrastructure of commercial space. Is that going to get repurposed in our cities as a result of the repurposing uh, commuting systems, et cetera? Uh, is, are we going to be completely redesigning cities around all of these things and if so what what's your view what what's what's the five-year peter forecast on commercial real estate as a result of this or the 2030 give yourself a little breathing room uh you know on, on commercial real estate i like i like to take the long view and as jll we have you know forecasts for the immediate and the longer view but i'll go back say 50 years frank or let's say 30 well, I, years I can go back I mean, 50. I mean, corporate real estate and commercial real estate, yeah. we were oversubscribed uh, in retail space in this country 20 times over Europe, for example. And we have had a complete transformation of retail uh, real estate. But then you look at the logistics space and the logistical demand, and we actually converted a major uh, corporate campus recently to a large logistics center. Um, I'll use our work here in New York post 9-11 we had um, 30 million square feet in lower Manhattan that was converted from commercial office space to residential space. It took 20 years, but it made lower Manhattan and downtown a thriving mixed use neighborhood. So I have clients where we're optimizing their portfolios by 30 to 50%. I have clients where we're gaining 30% of new space in class A buildings. I have clients where we're going to end up probably neutral by 2025 or 2027. We're going to rebalance their entire portfolios. So the flight to quality over the last two years should not be, um, you know, uh, uh, unrecognized. I mean, you cannot get an envelope of space right now in New York easily in a Class A building due to the demand. So there's been a flight to quality. There will be reoptimization of portfolios. The digital talent and talent attraction requirements and ESG requirements and sustainability requirements and the energy management requirements and the technology integration requirements are all top priorities for my clients and our clients. And so they are going to utilize their portfolios in ways to attract talent, to improve performance. And if they can optimize on cost, they will. But I will share with you, Frank, I have one client where we're going to invest $1.2 billion in about 4,000 new conference room settings for hybrid workplace collaboration as an example of investment. And I know we're facing a recession. We have the headwinds, economic headwinds that may be coming. So there will be opportunities. And, you know, in my 1.5 billion square feet, I've taken portfolios from 200 million square feet down to 100 million square feet in a matter of months. So optimization is entirely possible. But I think this time versus the last great recession, we're going to see new investments 
um, organize themselves and clients organize new investments to smart workplace technology, to class A space for digital talent, to address climate change risk and technology integration uh, and technology performance. So I think it's, and, and co-working. Co-working, I think, is going to have an interesting resurgence, and it's already having that. For instance, here in New York, it's it's been slow, but we see that resurgence also occurring in parallel to everything else that I just mentioned, and we'll be working in the metaverse an hour to two hours a day. So do I do a co-working site? Do I go to the metaverse? Do I work from my home office? Do I go to my office? Do I work from an alliance partner location? I mean, today I can choose six to seven different places where I yep. can work. Well, and I, I, I think, I mean, you're absolutely right. We have a myriad of choices uh, overall. And I think that it's not going to be where you work, but what platform you're working on uh, mm -hmm. to your your old uh, your earlier comment about your your trans uh, formation and moving forward with various Apple products uh, it's what platform you're going to be working yeah. on I think and your your how those platforms interact and I uh, use video again uh, we used to ha have to have a, an intermediary to connect our video systems together so you'd be one on one platform and I'd be on another and we right. would use uh, an intermediary to connect our two platforms and what was that awful and expensive um uh, today it's all just magically occurs and, and i think that's what we're going to see most people working in these future environments will not even notice that they happen yes it'll be you seamless know, absolutely it, right it will be very seamless it will just be the way things are uh, yeah. uh but what goes on behind the scenes and the rationalizing of portfolios and your comment about your 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 client investing in meeting rooms one of the trends because you you mentioned co-working one of the trends we're seeing in, in the co-working and, and flexible workspace sector globally is the development of more meeting rooms per square foot or per center yeah um, right. uh, Historically, a, a 20,000 foot uh, facility had three meeting rooms. Today, a right. new 20,000 foot facility will have five to seven. It doesn't sound like much, but it's a 100% increase. And I, I, I think it makes total sense. Last 60 months or 48 months even. Yeah. Um, and, and that will continue to occur because the space we need is space to interact with others not to space to sit at the desk and work solo correct uh, uh, and that is a big change for for all of us uh and it's gonna it's gonna be fascinating and fun and i i think that's it this is a time to be we have recession we have headwinds we have all these things to think about but we should just darn right be excited because this is going to be a lot of fun and give us unimaginable creative capability. And uh, what could be better than that? I don't know. I would agree, Frank. I, you know, I was just recently promoted to global head of future of work at JLL. And if I think about my career and my own journey, I've never been so excited and engaged and busy, I might add, in in what is now evolving in this you know post pandemic hybrid workplace evolution so it's incredibly exciting and uh you know for those of us who've been on the journey we recognize this new very exciting and dynamic inflection point it's really significant well it it is and and um we're running short long on time here so we're going to have to tie things up but peter um, I think the thoughts that you've brought, the reinforcement of where the future of work is going, uh, the combination of people, place, and technology all bound together into a, a single uh, deliverable structure, um, that's uh, fascinating and something that I'd like to have a chance to explore and uh, dive a little deeper dive uh, on another session someday, if that's okay. I'd love to, Frank, and appreciate all of your great thought leadership and your commitment uh, with all work. Um, we greatly, you know, appreciate your contributions. I think they're just tremendous. So thank you so much for having me on today. 
our pleasure. Really look forward to it. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.